All right, welcome Z Stars to an awesome video for errors in significance testing. Sorry, I got a little bit of a hoarse throat you're gonna have to deal with here, so hopefully you can understand what I'm saying. So what happens is in a significance test, sometimes an error is made. First and foremost, I'm not talking about a mathematical error, like you did something wrong. Please follow the four steps as I've taught you. We're talking about a different type of error here. This is not an error that you made. This is like a hypothetical error. Let me explain. So imagine we have a null hypothesis that the true proportion equals 90%. And the alternative is a one-tailed upper test where we claim that the true proportion is greater than 90%. Now what that means is that we're looking for something significant to happen way out here. Well, if we do find a sample way out here, then we're going to reject the null and we're going to go with the alternative. But what if that was the wrong decision? What if we just found one really, really weird sample? Maybe it was biased or something, who knows? But it was just a weird sample that shouldn't have been found. So realistically, we shouldn't have rejected the null or we just found this one crazy sample. Or likewise, maybe we find a sample over here somewhere that's not significant and we end up not rejecting the null, we keep the null, but we should have rejected it. Like, you know, like that was just a weird sample that, that was one sample that was kind of likely, but you know, the point is, is that an error was made in the decision. Again, you don't take this as you're making a wrong decision. This is just a hypothetical. A better way of maybe understanding this is by doing something a little bit less statistical. For example, we have a guy who's on trial for a crime. And the null going into the trial is that he is innocent. And the alternative is that he is not innocent, which means he's guilty. And this does happen in trials. Sometimes an innocent man goes to jail. Again, the jury didn't do anything wrong. The judge didn't do anything wrong. It was just, well, for whatever reason, the evidence was presented in a way that they thought the guy was guilty, but he really wasn't. Sadly enough, that does happen. Or another type of error could be that uh, a guilty man goes free. So the alternative is true. This suspect really is guilty of his crime. But the jury, for whatever reason, finds that he is um, not guilty. They, they don't have enough evidence to say that he did it. So again, this is hypothetical. We hope these things don't happen, but sometimes they do. Let's talk about these two different types of errors in detail. The first error is called a type 1 error, not the most original of names, but type 1 error. In a type 1 error, the null hypothesis is in fact true. But the error is we reject the null and say that the alternative is true. So it is an error, right? If the null is true, we should keep it. We should fail to reject the null, but an error has been made. So the null hypothesis is true, but the error is we reject the null and say the alternative is true. This is sending an innocent man to jail. The truth is he's really innocent, but we mistake, we make a mistake and we send him to jail. A type 2 error, again another really creative name, but a type 2 error is the alternative is true, but the error is that we fail to reject the null, meaning a false null is kept. So the alternative is really true. The guy really is guilty. He really did commit the crime. But we make an error and a guilty man goes free. So first and foremost, these do not have the most original of names. So the number one error is that kids just mix them up. So really take time to study and make sure you remember what a type 1 error is and a type 2 error is. Easiest way to remember it is a type 1 error. The null is true. But the error is we don't see that. Type 2, the alternative is true. But the error is we keep a false null. All right. Now, as hard as these things are, the one thing I want to keep in mind is that you're never going to be asked, hey, did you make a type 1 error? Hey, did you make a type 2 error? You're never going to know, right? It's just like when an innocent man goes to jail. We thought he was guilty, so we sent him to jail. I mean, unless some DNA evidence comes out, but that's a different topic. But the point is that I'm never going to ask you, neither is the AP going to ask you if these errors occur. You just have to be able to understand the potential possibility of them in context. So here's a good example for us to practice this. A drug company develops a new drug to cure headaches. 
The Food and Drug Administration says that the drug can only be sold to the public if it can show that the drug is more than 90% effective, meaning it must work for well over 90% of people who take it. So if we could show that this drug works for well over 90% of people, then we are going to be allowed to sell it. So let's talk about a type 1 and type 2 error. First, we do need our null and we need an alternative hypothesis. So the null would be that status quo. The proportion of people is still 90%. It's not significantly more. Your null is that it's, it's not what we are hoping for. The alternative is what this drug company is hoping for. They're hoping to show that their new drug works for well over 90% of people. All right, so in a type 1 error, keep in mind that the null is true. So the truth is that it is only 90% effective, which Food and Drug Administration says that's not good enough. It's got to be well over 90%. So a type 1 error, the truth is that it's only 90% effective, but we see otherwise. We think it's more effective, so we sell the drug. So we think more than 90% of people are going to get cured, when in reality, that's not true. So what kind of consequences does this have? Well, think about it. This means that we're going to sell this drug. The Food and Drug Administration is going to let us sell this drug. We're going to market this drug that it's going to help cure your headache. We're going to put on the labeling that more than 90% of people will get their headaches cured. But it's all a lie. So we wasted a ton of money selling a drug that is not as effective as we thought. We are essentially having false advertising because we're selling, we're telling the people that it does work for more than 90% of people, but that's not true. And furthermore, the Food and Drug Administration let us sell a drug that should never have been sold in the first place. So that would be a type 1 error. A type 2 error is the alternative is true. There really is more than 90% effective here. So more than 90% of people will get their headaches cured. But the error is we fail to see that. We think the null is true. Or we think that we don't have enough evidence to go with the alternative. So what happens here in consequence, right, what's an actual consequence of this? This is like a missed opportunity. This company had an opportunity to sell a great drug that does work. It does work for more than 90% of people. But we didn't see it that way. Um, so another consequence is that us, the consumers who have these headaches that we wish would go away, have a new drug that could work, a new drug that could make our headaches go away, but it never even gets sold because they mistakenly believe that it's under 90%, not more than 90%. So again, that's a good problem to kind of understand. And this is the type of problem that you may see on the AP test asking you, not did you make one of these errors, but asking you to hypothetically think about the idea of what a type 1 error would mean in context and what a type 2 error would mean in context. Now, just a little bit more about this error. Now, alpha is the probability of making a type 1 error. Now, that is the same alpha that we use for our level of significance. So when you choose an alpha level of, say, 0.01, for a significance test, you are basically making the decision that there is a 1% probability of a type 1 error being made. Now, did you make it? Did you not make it? Don't worry about that. That's just the probability of a type 1 error being made. A, the probability of a type 2 error is called beta, which in the AP curriculum, you do not have to worry about calculating. We will never ask you to calculate beta, so you don't really have to associate a number with beta, but just know that the probability of a type 2 error occurring is beta. Now, also understand that these two different things work in opposites. So if you try to lower your alpha, maybe to 0.01, to have less of a chance of type 1 error, you will inadvertently increase the probability of a type 2 error, beta. Now, they don't go way up. Both of these numbers are very low to begin with, but they do work in opposites. Or if you increase your um, alpha, maybe to say 5%, then you do have a larger chance of a type 1 error, but that will lower your chance of a type 2 error. Now, the last thing that does tie into this is power. Power is a very awesome word. Everybody wants power, or at least we all want superpowers, right? That'd be pretty cool. But power is actually a statistical term. It actually has a statistical meaning. Power is the probability 
we correctly reject a false null and go with the alternative when the alternative is really true. So think of power as a good thing. Power is making the right decision. If the guy really did commit the crime, he should go to jail. That's having power, doing the right thing. Now, this is the complete opposite of type 2 error. Remember, type 2 error, the alternative is really true. He really should go to jail. He really is guilty. But we fail to see that. Where power is the opposite of that. Power says, if he really is guilty, if he really did go to jail, we should see that. So let's talk about power in this example down here with our um, headache drug. If the truth really is that more than 90% of people will get cured with this drug, then power is our ability to conclude that. Concluding that the drug really does work and that the null should be rejected because the drug really does have a more than 90% effective rate. That's power. That's a good thing. Now, the only thing I will say um, with power is well, two things, actually. First, the probability of power is 1 minus beta. Because if beta and power are literally the complete opposites, type 2 error is the complete opposite of power. Power is doing the right thing. Type 2 error is doing the wrong thing. Then they are complete opposites. So just for example, if your beta was 0.02, 2% chance, then you would have a 98% chance of doing the right thing. But again, don't ever worry about calculating beta, which means you'll never, in my class, have to worry about actually calculating power either. You just have to understand the idea of it. Now, the one question that does come up you will need to know how to answer is how to get more power. The number one way to get more power is a bigger sample size. And this should make so much sense if you've been paying attention to my videos. Bigger samples will always more accurately reflect the truth. So if the truth really is way more than 90%, a bigger sample will show me that, hence allow me to conclude that. Or if the truth is that it's not bigger than 90%, a bigger sample will also show me that. So a bigger sample will always give you more power. So if you really are trying to show something is you know, an alternative, if you're really trying to show that an alternative is true, a bigger sample should more clearly show you that, which will give you more power to conclude that. So keep that in mind. All right, guys, hope this was a nice, quick, short video over error. It does come up on the AP test every year in terms of like a multiple choice question and or a free response. We just have to talk about the potential possibility of these errors in context. So get to practicing this. Hopefully your teacher will give you some good practice problems in class. That way you can really, um, you know, refine your skills. All right, guys, see you on the next video.